So, anybody recognize this? Know what that is? It's called a chiasm. A chiasm is what it's actually called. And a chiasm is actually a literary pattern. And it's based on something that is told in the shape of two corresponding and ascending sides that reach a pinnacle point of focus like a triangle, but a triangle is not quite a good example, more like a mountain because there are many facets to a chiasm. And the creation account is a, a chiasm. And I will show you how it works. You see, you have one side that where you form, and you have the other side that fills. But not only do these sides both go up, they also correspond with one another. You notice that? Until again, you reach a pinnacle. So, what we have here, we'll just kind of go over it quickly. You have day one of creation. God forms the heavens and the earth and separates day from night. That's what he does here. Day four, God fills the space with the sun, the moon, and the stars. Day two, God forms the space, the atmosphere that is our air, separating the waters from the water, creating an atmosphere. Day five, he fills it with birds and fish. Day three, he forms the dry land. Day six, he fills the dry land with plants, animals, and man. So we're left at this point with seven. Day seven is the pinnacle. Day seven is what all this was working towards. Day seven is the day that God formed in which he rested and filled with blessing and sanctity. Blessing and sanctity. So, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis 2, 1 through 3, because we now are going to, and I want you to actually bookmark Genesis 2, 1 through 3, because we'll re be referring back to it every once in a while. So, Genesis 2, 1 through 3. And it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all the, his work which God created and made. Now, I think we can all figure out that God does not need any kind of physical rest, don't, right? So what is this rest that he was in? What is this rest? This is not a rest in the sense of physical rest, physical exhaustion. This is a rest in the sense of satisfaction. He was pleased. He was happy. He was fulfilled because all that he did was good and this is the pinnacle of it all the height of it all 
And of course, the word sanctified means that he set apart. He uh, made it unique, distinctive from every other day. It was all by itself. It was the pinnacle. And it represents that it is about God as our creator. It is representative that he set apart a unique space of time that we may all enjoy fellowship with him. And this is why if anybody ever says that the Sabbath was only for the Jewish people, all they have to do is read this because this was way before there was ever such a thing as a Jew. This is creation. This was before there was ever such a thing as sin. This is creation. Now, Jesus has something to say about this. I want you to turn to Mark 2, 27. Mark 2, verse 27. Simple verse. Mark 2, verse 27. And it says, And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Okay, this all happened before there was ever, of course, there was a Jewish nation. This all happened before any sin entered. This was a special engagement for all people, all mankind, with their maker. And it brings us to another point in creation that I want to point out here. Human beings were created when? We know it was on the sixth day, right? We get that part. But they were created last. Okay? This is a strong point here. They were created last. Why were they created last? Why were they created last? Because God made everything for the sole purpose of man. Man had no part in creation. When God created man, he simply handed it over to him. Why? This is ultimate in love, isn't it? No participation, didn't witness creation. They awoke to life as objects of grace. Recipients by faith of life and all its pleasure as a free gift. Isn't that amazing? He literally created man and then said, here you go. I just went through all this, all six days, and now I'm giving it to you. Was there any merit involved? No. He simply just handed it to man. The same quality of relationship also holds true for the work of what? Salvation. Doesn't it sound familiar? God creates a world that we had nothing to do with. Nothing whatsoever. And salvation has the same connotations. And I, we will get into it. And I want to now turn to Exodus 20. Exodus 20. And we're going to look at verses 8 to 11. You see, we were already looked at Exodus 20 the last time I preached to you because it was about God's Ten Commandments. Now we're going to look at a specific commandment. We're looking at the Sabbath commandment. So, chapter 20 of Exodus, verses 8 to 11, and they say, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, not th nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. 
For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And as you can see, as we learned the last time I spoke with you, the Ten Commandments are God's law. God's law is a part of him. It is a character. It is a law of what? Love, right? Law of liberty. Law that frees us. It is a law of love. And if God is love, and God is what? God is eternal and changeless. Therefore, his love is eternal and changeless. Therefore, his law is eternal and changeless. Because they are all in one. His love, his law, and who he is, is all one. His law is his character. So, you have to ask yourself, what is the logic of putting a day of rest in this law? This law that is eternal, that is changeless. What is the point of this? The chiasm is the clue. It's the pinnacle. It's the top of the heap. That's where God sits, at the top of the mountain. That's who he is. Without that, the structure is gone. And it seems like man becomes the pinnacle. But there's no pinnacle when you have six. It just li literally sits there. Right? You have to have the pinnacle. You have to have a point of reference. That's the Sabbath. The Sabbath is established. It identifies something. What does it do? Verse 11 again. What does verse 11 say? It says, For in six days the Lord made heaven, earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Remember I told you to bookmark Genesis 2? Go back to Genesis 2. We're going to look at that for a quick moment. Je excuse me, Genesis 2. And I'm going to start at verse 2. And it says, And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made and rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Three times it tells us that God is the creator. Do you think it's something important? It's extremely important. The Sabbath is the apex of our worship. It is not just some day off. It is the apex of our worship. I want you to think about that. It is extremely important extremely uh, necessary. It identifies God as our creator and it identifies who we are as to who God is. We are his created beings. You see, that's what it does. It also puts our position as one of restful dependence on him. Right? He is the one who does all the work. Anything that we do, any work that we do, anything that we build, anything that we, that we are, exists in the parameters of the work God has already done for us by creating us, uh, all our powers, and the material world that we live in. Everything comes from God. So let us compare another verse. Let's go to Deuteronomy 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Just over a couple of books. And we're going to look at verses 12 to 15. Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 5, Moses repeats the Ten Commandments. But we're going to once again look specifically at the Sabbath commandment. And we're going to see something in a different light. It says here, 
Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember that thou was the servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath holy. Is there anything in there that talks about God as our creator? Not like the first one, right? The first one talks a lot about, I mean, it, it tells us who God is, he, that the Sabbath represents him as our creator. But there is something here it says about God, doesn't it? And it's found in verse 15. And that is, what? He saves them. He saves them. So now he is using the Sabbath as what? Not so much, a, not only a memorial for creation, but of deliverance from slavery. Deliverance from slavery or redemption. Just as creation was achieved by God, by God's power alone, and we are the recipients of the gift, salvation is achieved by God's power alone, and we are the recipients of the gift. You see what's going on? In fact, the Bible speaks repeatedly of salvation using creation language. Let's go to King David's confession, Psalm 51. King David's heart-wrenching confession in Psalm 51 with what he did with Bathsheba. But we're going to look at a couple of verses here. Remember what I said the last time? That David was a man after God's heart? Not because of what he did so much as because of where his heart was. I want you to look at this. It's Psalm 51 verses 10 to 12. And it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy what? Salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. So here we are using creation uh, using creation language for salvation. Create in me a new heart. There's some creation going on here. Let's turn to Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. And we will see in the New Testament how it is placed. Ephesians 2, verses 8 to to 10. And it says, For by grace we are saved through faith, and that not of what? Yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Just like creation, we didn't do anything that would merit or warrant us to even consider we did anything in creation. It was already done when we were there, when we were created. The last thing created. Same thing with this. There's nothing we have done when it comes to our salvation. Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You see, this is, this is the language. Salvation and creation, they tend to go hand in hand. 
It's very interesting. I want to look at now what Jesus says using Sabbath language from Genesis. In John 17, verse 4. John 17, verse 4. Again, I hope you have bookmarked Genesis 2. John 17, verse 4. John 17, verse 4. And it says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have what? Finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Let's go back to Genesis 2, verse 1. Genesis 2, just verse 1. And it says here what? Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. Using the same language, Christ is saying, I finished the work you have given me. The work is done. And of course, in John 19, 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said what? It is finished. We all kind of remember that, John 19, verse 30. He says, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The job was done. The work was over. He had done the job. And it's quite interesting because Christ died the latter part of the sixth day. Man was created on the latter part of the sixth day. When Christ died, just as man was the final point on that latter part of the sixth day, Christ became us, and he was also part of the latter part. He died what we should have died. He took upon himself the death that we probably would have died right then and there. Sixth day, latter part. He ended it for us so that we can continue. He was the lamb that was able to open the book in heaven. That's another story, but, I'm, but it, it, has, it ties all together. So on the Friday, what we call Friday afternoon, Christ died. Then he rested the Saturday, which is the seventh day. He rested through those, those, that time and was resurrected when? First day. If the Sabbath was a rest day, then it only makes sense that he wouldn't rise until Sunday. Just like God as our creator, Jesus is also our creator, just as he rested on the Sabbath at the beginning in creation, he rested and used the Sabbath again when it came to his own rest in redemption. And if you want to see what day he rose, it says it over and over, Luke 23, 54 to Luke 24, 3. It talks about how he was raised on the first day and all this activity started happening on the first day. Right? But the seventh day was rest. He was finished his work. Just as he finished creation, he finished salvation. On the, on the sixth day and rested the seventh. He finished his work on that memorial day. And thus we see the, that the Sabbath is God's weekly reminder to us that our salvation is 100% the free gift of his grace. Totally his accomplishment, not ours to be received into our hearts by faith. As such, the Sabbath guards against legalism and self-dependence and secures all our hope and trust in Jesus, who is both our creator and savior. The Sabbath tells us that good works contribute what? Zero, nothing to our salvation. But 
while at the same time, they do reveal God's mighty creative work in us, which brings forth obedience of the right quality. Not, it comes from the inside out. That's where it's supposed to be. Obedience comes from the inside out. It doesn't come from the outside in. Because that's already done. This brings us to a relationship, another relationship about the Sabbath that a lot of people will argue with you about. And that is that the Sabbath is a part of the new covenant. And because the Sabbath is a memorial by grace through Christ Jesus alone, it also signifies the new covenant which teaches that true obedience to God's law springs forth from inside, motivated by love. So we're going to look at a prophecy now. I want you to turn to Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56, 1 to 7. Isaiah 56, verses 1 through 7. This is a prophecy that was given to Isaiah a prophecy about the new covenant. And it says, Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come. You hear that? My salvation is near to come. And my righteousness to be revealed. See, this is something that's coming. It's a foreshadowing going on here. Blessed is the man that doeth this. Who is the man? And the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the, command, but the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Who, who, what man was this? Yeah, it's only Jesus. He's the only one that didn't do any evil. He kept his hand from polluting the Sabbath. How important is Sabbath? He's mentioning it right here. This is in the Old Testament. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my what? Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. Who do you think he's talking about when he says sons and daughters? Do you think he's a better name? He's talking about coming from the old covenant thinking He's talking about the children of Israel. This is going to be something new. It'll be a better name. It'll be a better understanding. By the sons and daughters, um, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the strangers that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain. Now, it's interesting that he says holy mountain, right? That, I mean, that is a language that comes from God, his holy mountain. You go back to the chiasm, don't you? You go back to the chiasm, holy mountain. And it says, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifice shall be accepted upon mine altar. For mine house shall be called a house of prayer for how many people? All people. This is, this is future. This is something that is coming. This is a prophecy that is based on Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and his New Testament church. And you look at the words, salvation, covenant, Sabbath, these all come together. 
and the fact that there's reference to non-Jewish believers. Now I want us to turn to Acts 13. Acts 13, and we're going to look at verses 13 and 14. Acts 13, verses 13 and 14. Acts 13, verses 13 to 14. Because now we're going to look at the fulfillment of this prophecy. Acts 13, 13 to 14 says, Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Now, it's not a whole lot of information because usually Jews go to the synagogue on the Sabbath, right? It's normal. But it's the next set of verses that we look at, which is not same Acts 13, but now we're going to look at verses 42 to 44. Acts 13, verses 42 to 44. Same chapter, different verses. And it says, And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them when? The next Sabbath. Interesting. If something had changed, wouldn't it be just the next day? Think about it. 43 says, Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the what? Whole city together to hear the word of God. This is something amazing. This is not a Jewish city. This is a Gentile city. And they, most of them all came to hear these marvelous words. Who were the ones that were, that were, um, who were questioning? Who were the ones that were looking for it? Didn't say the Jews were looking for it, did it? Said the Gentiles were looking for it. The Gentiles were, bese were beseeching them, please come back, give us more information. It is a fulfillment of Isaiah 56. Both Jews and Gentiles were Sabbath keepers. And this makes absolute sense. That the Sabbath is a memorial of both the finished works, two finished works of creation and salvation. So, we have a problem. And that problem is, is that most of Christianity goes, keeps Sunday as a day of rest. And it's a problem because there's, not only that, they actually say that if you keep the Sabbath, you're legalists, okay? But actually, as we've seen, the Sabbath is the exact opposite of legalism. So let's look at this. First, first, the Sabbath cannot change, for it was established at creation, and it's also part of God's law of love. So right off the bat, it can't change. We know that his love is unchanging, and we know that it's eternal. Secondly, the Sabbath which began as a memorial of God's creative power is also a memorial of God's saving power and therefore the very opposite of legalism. Why? It is by virtue of what it commemorates. The fact that we can do nothing for ourselves. So if the Sabbath is a commemoration of the fact that we can't do anything for ourselves, how is it legalism? How is it legalism? Because you can't be saved 
by keeping Sabbath. That's not what it's there for. It's a memorial. There's a reason. It is in the law. So what happened? So what happened? Why do so many churches keep Sunday? Actually, history will tell you. It's very simple. And it's not meant to be a dig. But it's a fact. It started with Emperor Constantine when he became a nominal Christian around 321 A.D., and was actually established by the ruling Catholic Church because at that time, all the pagan sun-worshipping cults worshipped on Sunday. So it was just simply brought in as an establishment, established day of worship. Sunday was never called Sunday. It was actually called the Venerable Day of the Sun. When you said Every other day of the week, when you came to Sunday, it was Venerable Day of the Sun. They just shortened it to Sunday. So it was a day of worship for the pagan sun worshipers. It was brought in later. And it's just a simple fact. That's all it is. That's how it came in. But it wasn't, it's not meant to be. There is absolutely no biblical, nothing biblical, that can, that can um, substantiate this. So... I want us to turn to our scripture reading now. Matthew 11. Matthew 11. And we're looking at verses 28 to 30. Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30, our scripture reading today. And it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So what is this labor that Jesus is speaking of? Of course it's not physical labor. It's the spiritual labor we put upon ourselves. The idea that we have to do something in order to be saved. He's lifted that burden. It's gone. We don't have that weight upon our shoulders anymore. We don't have to say, wow, I have to do this in order to be saved. Christ has already done it. We have nothing that we can do We cannot work out our own salvation. It is not the rest of the body, but of the soul. The deeper rest that we really need, knowing that God saves us by his grace, because what? He loves us. It's just that simple. He simply loves us. And not because we have done sufficient work to make ourselves worthy of his love, it, it, and this is a problem. I know even I've had this problem myself, but we can do nothing that will change how much he loves us. Whether you're the most righteous and virtuous person on this earth or you're the worst person that ever was born, God loves you just the same. He loves you just the same. We don't have to work this problem out. That's what makes it good. That's what makes it wonderful. We don't have to work out our own salvation. Because God has already done it. Just like he did it in creation. Just like he did at that time. He made everything on those seven days. And then on the sixth day, the last part of the sixth day, he created man. And then gave him an opportunity to witness one thing. And that's the Sabbath. I did all this for you. Come and join me in fellowship. It's wonderful. It's it's love. And then as we enter into the restfulness of his grace, we are aroused, energized. We are um, motivated to love him 
in return. And when we love him in return, what did Jesus say about that? If you love me, what? It becomes full circle. You're doing something he wants you to do because he did something you didn't deserve. You, it's, it's, it's gratitude. It's love. It's like, wow, I can't believe you would do that for me. This is amazing. It doesn't abolish the law, and neither does it say that we can just go ahead and do whatever we want, not even for one second. In fact, if anything, if anything, the onus is on us to follow him. He's made it extremely easy. He's not only done this for us, but he's also given us the Holy Spirit to guide us. You know, I mean, there is no more excuse for this, right? We don't have the excuse. Every week, the Sabbath tells us this truth again, over and over. Inviting us to rest in God's love. We rest in his love. He's done the work. Let's go back to Mark, Mark 2, 27, 28, one last time. Just want you to turn to Mark 2, we're going to look at both 27 and 28. Mark 2, 27, 28. And it says, And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not, the, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is what? Lord also of the Sabbath, which means that the Sabbath really is the Lord's day. It is the Lord's day. It belongs to him. It was set apart to him as holy. Who else belongs to him? We do. We belong to him. He redeemed us by grace in which we rest through faith. He made Sabbath for mankind as a weekly reminder for our utter dependence on him for salvation and literally took the burdens off of us at Calvary. 